Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there. I looked at the beginnings of Mother's Day here in America and come to find out there's a record of some kind of Mother's Day all the way back in ancient Greek and Roman times. But how it got recognized as a national holiday here was because a woman without kids named Ann Jarvis felt it was important to have a day set aside to celebrate mothers, which I agree with. Mothers sacrifice and they give. The roles that many mothers play are these, right? N they're a nurse, a teacher, they're a chef, a counselor in those times when we need uh, some counsel. They're a protector. They care are caretakers, encouragers, they're cheerleaders. They're a director, they direct, help direct our days and our paths. They're managers, they help us to manage our time and they teach us to manage our time. They're a cleaner, they're providers even, they're chauffeurs to get us around to those places that we can't get to. They're prayer warriors. And way more than that, mothers should be celebrated. It's interesting to see how something, or excuse me, she worked, Ann Jarvis worked with a florist in her church to have a celebration for mothers, and many, many people came out to celebrate. So Ann Jarvis petitioned the government for a day to celebrate mothers. And in 1908, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson declared that the second Sunday of May would become Mother's Day. Within just a few years, however, though, it became a major holiday of earning profit for florists, for card companies, and the merchants. And because of this, though, by 1920, Ann Jarvis had had enough, and she became disgusted of all the commercialism and denounced the national holiday of Mother's Day. It's interesting to see how something that was meant to celebrate mothers was used for personal gain. But that, that shouldn't surprise us. When we get our eyes off of the original intent of what is right and honorable, and we begin to focus upon the self and selfish gain, we very quickly we very quickly begin to taint what was, meant, what was once meant for good. This happens because we don't guard our heart, and what then begins to follow is misaligned intention and wrongful gain. This morning, we're going to look at a verse in Proverbs that I, you know, I've heard quoted many times over the last few years especially. Sometimes it's been quoted... In, a, in the correct context, and sometimes quoted in a very liberal context that sometimes barely squeaks out a very sort of understanding of what is truly meant in the, in the proverb. But before we look at our verse, here is the point I want to get to today. I've titled this sermon, Go to the Well. So here's the point. Go to the correct well, the well of Jesus. Be fueled and filled by who and what he is and by the things that he says. He promises living water that flows. It matters what well you and I go to and what well we draw water from. Because that water fuels you, it affects your very being, all of who you are. Tainted water, tainted bacteria, infected water will lead to sickness. Clear, pure water will not lead to sickness, but actually can and does lead to a greater refreshing and a stronger health the more you drink of that clear and pure water. In John chapter 4, Jesus goes to the well, to a well to rest after a long day. And he, as he was there, a Samaritan water comes to draw water up from the well. When she draws the water, Jesus asks her for a drink. And surprised by this, she asked him why he was asking her for a drink. Because she was a Samaritan woman and he was a Jewish male. Jews did not like Samaritans, and it was kind of reciprocated. And for a male Jew to ask a Samaritan woman, that was doubly countercultural and very taboo. But Jesus ignored her question, and he instead responded this way. If you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Jesus never claimed to be living water, but that he would give it. And let's skip ahead to John 7, 38 to hear who he's talking about. Who is the living water? And he said this, anyone who is thirsty, come to me. Anyone who believes in me, 
may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And the very next verse following tells us who the living water is. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him, who is Jesus. First, can we just stop and admit there are times that we get tired? We don't have much emotionally left. Our ability to show grace, maybe, to forgive in that moment, to have a kind word, to deal with that one more just, that messy room, or one more complaint, that ability to deal with, it's gone. Come to Jesus. Go to Jesus. If we are truly honest with ourselves in that moment, we probably are looking for a fix to the problems, an easy fix. But deep down inside, what we really want we want something that will do more than just fix the problem, but actually will refresh us. It'll encourage us and empower us. Take a moment and dip your bucket into the well. That may look like a time of rest, but it will be even deeper, more clarifying, and more life-giving when that rest is filled with a moment of prayer and God's Word. Go to Jesus. So who is the living water if it isn't Jesus? Like we read a second ago in those verses, the Spirit of God is the living water. When Jesus goes to sit at the right hand of the Father in the place of authority set for Him, He promised to send the Spirit of God. It is the ministry of the Spirit flowing out of the heart redeemed by God that blesses believers and through them brings life and light to the world. Actually, let me, let me read that again. It is the ministry of the Spirit of God flowing out of a heart redeemed by God that blesses believers and, through them, brings life and light to the world. It's the effect, it's the manifestation, the external influence of the Spirit of God that flows out of the heart of the one that goes to the well of Jesus and drinks of all that he is, does, and says to us. It matters what we put in. What we put in affects our very being and what comes out of us is how, it, is how it, it affects you and even has an effect to those around you. Solomon in Proverbs chapter 4 is telling his son to listen to his words and his corrections. It is wisdom that is passed down to him by his dad and that wisdom is wisdom from the Lord. Why should the son listen? He says this, My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Solomon wants his son to ingest and to digest what it is that he is telling his son. Why? Because he knows it will give him direction filled with stability, satisfaction, and safety. In the beginning words of Proverbs, Solomon says these wisdom sayings. He says these wisdom sayings, th their purpose is to teach people wisdom and dis discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined, and successful lives to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Children of all ages, it is important to listen to our mothers. It's Mother's Day, so we're going to focus it that direction a little bit. We honor our parents when we give weight to what it is they say. By that, I mean this. Honor them when we listen to we honor them when we listen to what they say. We seek to understand what they say, and then we work to put into action those honorable principles that they teach us. Proverbs 1:8 says this says, My child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instructions. And Proverbs 23, 25 says, Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. Let your father and mother be glad. For the mothers, and really for us fathers too, but it's Mother's Day, I realize this actually kind of puts some kind of burden upon us. 
But it is a burden worthy of carrying. And we got to remember, Jesus said his burden is light. And that burden is worthy of carrying because it benefits you by benefiting your children. May I encourage you to be fervent to go to the well of Jesus. Dip your pail into all that he says. The living water will flow out of you and it will affect your children. It will have an impact upon them. Go to the well often and drink from it often. Let it fill you more than any other source. Let it overflow out of you and spill onto them. It may take time, but it will seep deep down. Don't give up, and by doing so, you will provide room for God to work. For us all, it is important to be intentional about what we put into our hearts and minds. Jesus said this, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. What you put in, you think about, Make important, that is what resides in the treasury of your heart. So the question I would ask, how do we get the right things to reside in our heart? First, we go to the right well. If you go to the right well of success, you will get a heart filled with a need for performance. If you go to the well of morality, you'll get a heart filled with a good person. If you go to the well of financial security, you will get a heart that chases money. If you go to the well of, of status, you will get a heart that chases fame and recognition. If you, if you go to the well of a relationship's security, you will get a heart looking for ways to keep a relationship. In reality, these aren't necessarily bad, but when they are the focus, something will always be not just quite right. There will always be something missing, a peace that isn't quite settled deep within, a love that is sought after instead of a love that is already there. If you go to the well of Jesus, you will find everlasting truth, everlasting purpose, everlasting peace, and everlasting love. That will be the foundation. That's the foundation we want. And when those, those storms of life hit and that child didn't perform quite right, their, their morality fell short that day, they lost their job and so they have no income. Or that relationship didn't work out their word comes crashing down on them, maybe. Or their world comes crashing down on them. You can help them navigate through the situation because your foundation is built upon the solid rock. Maybe your house has weathered some storms. The paint's cracking. Maybe some of the shingles have been blown off over the years. Maybe a board or two is even missing. But your house didn't crumble because it was built upon, it was, it was built upon the rock. It was not built upon the sand. Going to the right well matters. The second way we get the right things to reside in our hearts is to fill our lives with God's word. We listen to God's instructions. We ingest and we digest God's instructions. Listen to this. Proverbs 4.13 says, Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Psalms 119 mentions hiding God's word in our heart. We meditate on it day and night, and so you will be sure to obey and be sure to obey everything written in it, is what Joshua 1.8 says. But catch, catch what the outcome is in this verse. The rest of the verse of Joshua 1.8 goes on and says, Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. If you want to train up a child in the way they should go, and you, you want that way to be a godly path, Fill your bucket so full with what God says it spills onto those around you. And in doing so, you will, you will begin to prosper and succeed at pouring the principles of, God's, uh, of, of God into your child's life and to others around you. You will begin to prosper and succeed at accomplishing God's will in your life. And it will become clear to them and it will be noticeable to them. As an important side note, though, I want to say this. I, I want you to notice something. The success, that success is found in your actions, not in your child's actions. As you meditate upon God's word and you begin to put it into action in your life, the spirit will begin to flow out of you those principles. 
Those principles will be noticed, like I said, but they may not be heeded. They may not be listened to. Children have a free will to choose to follow the heart of Scripture or to deny it. Your role is simply to reflect the heart of God to them. They have to work it out with Jesus themselves. Pray so hard and much for them, though, that your knees become calloused from all the time you spend on them bringing your kids and situations to Jesus. God hears you, trust Him, and in, in the right time, He will respond. The third way to get the right things to reside in our hearts is to do what God says. Okay, the first, the first of our, uh, our ways to reside in, uh, to reside, to get the right things to reside in our heart, the first is to go to the right well. The second is to fill our lives with God's word. And the third is to do as God's word says. We practice God's word. We put it into action. In listening to God's word and seeking to do God's word, we also ask and trust that the spirit of God is going to work through and in that process. Listen, listen to Galatians 5. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Verse 5, But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness that God has promised to us. Verse 13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom. My brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. And then verse 16 goes on and says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what sinful nature craves. And then there's verses 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Who doesn't want that for themselves and who doesn't want that even more so for their kids to experience those things but listen to verse 25 since we are living by the spirit let us follow the spirit's leading in every part of our lives we follow his leading but and then there's galatians 6 8 b through 9 says this but those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit and catch this next part so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. The Spirit of God will be in the process, helping us, directing, reminding us, encouraging us, and bringing about the results. Our responsibility is to work to put God's Word into action, to do it. And, and the Spirit's responsibility is to work it out through us, to give us understanding, to lead us, to guide us. The fourth way we get the right things to reside in our hearts is to intentionally turn from evil things that maybe we struggle with. Galatians 6a tells us, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. We don't want those that we love to have decay and death poured out on them. We don't want to go to that well. So let's run from the evil things that we struggle with. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's a wrong relationship. Maybe it's comparing. Maybe we compare, we compare our kids' educational success or how clean and tidy our home is. Maybe we compare our looks even. Maybe it's in how successful we feel about meaning, re, re, meaningful relationships. Things get kind of rocky and so we panic, we manipulate, and we run from conflict. Maybe it's the past defining us instead of being defined by what Jesus did for us and how God sees us. Proverbs 4, 24 to 27 says, Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from cor corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. One translation says, keep your feet from turning towards evil. 
All of this is in context of the verse that we're going to look at this morning. It's Proverbs 4.23, which says this, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Some translations say, it's, for it is the wellspring of life. I have heard this phrase in this verse, the, the phrase, guard your heart in respect to love and risks. Guard your heart so that you don't love too soon and get hurt. Or guard your heart and don't take any risks that can emotionally hurt you. The context of this verse is telling us to be sure to live according to God's word instead. It is telling us to fill our hearts with truth and then make sure to guard that truth so we don't forget it or ignore it. And as we grow in the knowledge and understanding of God's word, we will have wisdom to take appropriate risks and to love in such a way that flows out of God's love for us and for others. And when those, those risks crash or maybe that vulnerability of loving another is abused in some way, we have a sure foundation that is unlike a house built on the sand, but it is like a house built on the solid foundation, the solid rock is Jesus. There might be some damage done to the house, but the foundation and even the structure of the house, it is still there. Throughout the Bible, we are taught that there is a direct connection between our hearts and our behavior. Guard your heart does not mean you protect yourself from getting hurt at all costs. Guard your heart means you protect your heart from sin at all costs. But in order to do that, we got to go to the right well. we got to draw from the right well. My encouragement to you is to think about the implications of what this verse truly means for you. Go to the well, be filled, and let living water consume you to the point where it begins to overflow onto those around you. Guard your hearts. And follow Jesus by seeking and by drawing from his well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this, this, uh, this, your word to us, the wisdom that it has for us. You are the source of life. You are the source of living water. You promised to give us your spirit. And Lord, in Ephesians, it talks about how uh, your spirit will indwell within us, indwell within those who receive your forgiveness, who say, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. You are the source of living water. You are the source of everything that I need that is good. And so, Lord, uh, I just pray, God, that this, this Mother's Day, it would be a, a, a day of celebration for the mothers. Lord, we thank you for the mothers you have put in our lives. And uh, God, I just pray your blessing upon them. And as we uh, go the rest of this day, just be honored. In your son's name, amen.